Okay, good morning, everyone. This is uh, lesson six in basic Bible teaching, Christology, which gives you a clue to what we'll be talking about today. Uh, the topic is Christ. So let me open up with prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for this opportunity to meet. Uh, thank you for the technology that allows this to be possible. With each person here today, as the word is laid out and explained that it would sink deep into them and they would understand it and act upon it. And we thank you for this topic. This is uh, all about you. And it's what we want to talk about. We ask these things in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. Quick review. Um, in fact, let me see if I can share the screen here. There we go. Okay, why does God give us boundaries? Anybody? Protection. Okay, good. Uh, he knows what's best for us and wants to protect us. So again, don't look at boundaries as uh, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence thing. Uh, look at it as uh, protection. Good. Next. Whoop. Uh, what are some of the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin? You can say for all mankind, for man, woman, whatever you want. Satan. Some of the consequences for man's sin. Painful childbirth. Okay. Painful childbirth. Anything else? Man was working the ground. Okay. Yes. The ground was cursed. You had to work a little harder. Anything else? Separation from God. Separation from God. Spiritual death, that's good. What about physical death? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Sin nature entered mankind. So this is an easy question. What is the ultimate consequence of sin? Death. Yeah, spiritual death. Uh, and as, as was mentioned earlier, separation from God, spiritual death. Okay, today we're going to discuss the answer to man's sin problem, which is what? We all know that. What's the answer to man's sin problem? Christ. Christ. Okay. Good. That's our, you know, it's your typical. This is the one time you're allowed to use your typical Sunday school answer. Remember, you can't go wrong 98% of the time if you say Jesus. So, <laughs> whatever, whatever I ask. So, because ultimately it is tied to him somehow, some way. So, uh, keep that in mind. Okay. So, I want to ask a question today. Uh, what are some popular worldviews of Jesus? Just anybody? Good prophet. Okay, a good one. What does that mean, a good prophet? Are there bad prophets? <laughs> no, he was just a good man. Okay. Okay, he was a prophet, and uh, he was good. Okay, anyone else? You're right. A fairy tale. Okay, some people think it was ma all made up. There was no, <clears throat> there was no, uh, there was no real Jesus, spiritual, physical, whatever. Okay, what else? A liar. Okay, some people probably thought that uh, he was lying. The the uh, scribes and Pharisees thought he was. They thought he was uh, impersonating the Son of God, lying about that. That's why they ultimately ended up trying to kill him. Okay, good. What else? They thought he was crazy. Okay, some people thought he was crazy. Uh, they labeled him the apocalyptic preacher. What does ap apocalyptic preacher mean? Use the big word there. <laughs> um, Book of the end of days. Yeah, that, that just means end times, end of days. He was very big on the future, talking about that. And uh, there were a lot of those going around around the first century. Uh, between 0 A.D. and 100 A.D. were a lot of those kind of preachers, quote unquote, going around the world talking. I don't know why they thought the world would end then. I think every generation thinks that the world will end in their generation. And uh, it's probably true or could be true. We don't know. So let me give you a couple ones here. How about this? Uh, <clears throat> we have the rock music Jesus. Any of you heard the the rock music Jesus? Doobie Brothers back in the 70s. Yep. This song, Jesus is just all right. Kids, some of these kids are too young for that, Red. I know. 
but that's that's why we're uh, showing this. Uh, can listen to that. <laughs> yes, yes. Some of some of us uh, listened to it, and some of us did not. But um, <laughs> this was what a big is. hit. Now I don't know anything about their spiritual condition or their motiv motivation for recording this song. I have no idea. Uh, I could probably research that, but. Uh, I think it's ministered to thousands of people, but what do you think the their their idea of Jesus is? He's just all right with me. There you go. He's all right with me. He's cool. I've got no problem with Jesus. Let me go on living my life any way I want to. Let him do what he wants. Let me do what I want. Uh, they just wrote a song about this guy named Jesus. Okay, good. And then, of course, we have the famous, everyone knows this one, uh, the country music Jesus. And what's what's this? How how the country music Jesus? How would you describe him? I don't know. I don't listen to country music. <laughs> I don't either. But uh, <laughs> I've heard of this song, and I've heard it come on the radio before I turned it off. <laughs> Basically, they that song "Jesus Take the Wheel" is about a girl who basically didn't have anybody else to count on, so she decided to pull over and pray to Jesus again and kind of renew her faith in a sense. Okay. At least that's what it sounds like to me. I may be interpreting that wrong, but. No, Emily, that, that's a very positive view of that song, which is okay. You're a very <laughs> positive person. Um, the negative view of that song would be that uh, they claim Jesus, they say grace, but they only run to him when there's trouble. Yeah. Uh, but their life doesn't reflect him. Now, hopefully, in this case, you know, that this song, this girl ran to him, and, it's, and she uh, decided to turn her life and, and stay there. But, uh, and then you have these Christian preachers and teachers, which we're one of them, that say we should sell out and commit our life to Jesus. So all, we have all these conflicting views of who Jesus is and how we should react to him. And, of course, you know, I want to digress for just a moment. Uh, the biggest thing we have today among people that call themselves Christians or cultural Christians, and you've heard this mentioned several times in the last couple of weeks, this MTD Christianity, moral the the therapeutic deism. And that's, that's what most cultural Christians practice. So what do you think a cultural Christian is? Let me stop the share for a moment. How would you, how would you label a cultural Christian? You could use the term nominal Christian. So they just basically by name or affiliation, they're Christian. They like, there's a lot of people that um, just because they live in America and attended church as they grew up, they, they didn't have any other way to describe their, their faith or their, where they stand. So they just say, I'm a Christian. So it, it uh, skews stats because they may not be truly following the faith. Okay. Now, obviously, we can't judge. We can't see their heart. But are, are most of these people truly saved? Take a guess. Again, we're not asking for judgment. This is a guess. There's a big difference. Likely not. Probably not. Uh, this is what most cultural Christians practice. We're going to go over a few of these beliefs just so you have some idea. You run into these people. Now, this does not apply to atheists because atheists believe what? There is, no God. there is no God. There's no use worrying about it, talking about it. But uh, most agnostics who hold the attitude, I don't care if there's a God or not, so what, uh, some of them would live this way. And again, what you, you'll run into a lot of people in the church living this way, especially kids of Christians. Uh, Christian kids live this way a lot. Uh, they, they just go off the program. Uh, it's hard to tell the difference. But here's, here's the belief. Uh, they believe that a God exists which is good, who created the earth, orders the world and watches over human life on earth, but sort of sits back and lets things just run. Okay, he's not really involved in the day-to-day -day activity, but they do believe in, in creation and they do believe that there's a God and that he created the earth and he watches over the earth. Uh, number two, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible by most of the world religions. Okay, and that, you know, that's not a bad thing. That's, they, they believe that, and they believe, you know, if you look at all the world religions, you can find all these same principles. Um, number three, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. 
okay? Now that, again, we're not saying these are good or bad necessarily, but if that is your primary goal in life, uh, is that good or bad? Anybody? Does the Bible tell us to do that? Our goal is to do what we have to do to be happy and to feel good about ourselves. No. No. I mean, we can find many verses that challenge that. Uh, you can live that way, but you won't be much of a dynamic, outgoing Christian because the Bible tells us to take up the cross and, and you know, that that's not a fun thing. There's a lot of things in the Bible of sacrifice and uh, like that. So again, now the other thing they have is God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. They believe that. And the last one, the scariest one, is good people go to heaven when they die. So this is the way most uh, cultural Americans, most of our, if you were to quiz our kids, they would probably say yes to all these. Uh, it's a scary thing. Uh, most of these people have not had to face their personal sin and deal with Jesus directly. They've, they've rode their parents' coattails. They've been in church. They've, they're able to go through all these motions. But this is really how they feel. And where we got this from was a... Uh, they did a, a survey with kids that had just graduated from high school going to college and in their 20s to find out what they really believed. So again, the reason they call it more moral the, the, therapeutic deism is because deism, what does deism mean? Anyone know? Okay, it's the idea that God made the world and stepped aside. There's no, God is not intimately involved with the world. He sees this big creator up in the sky and, and he leaves out the earth alone and everything just happens. Uh, God's not intimately involved. There's no providence. There's no, he doesn't get involved. There's no miracles, any of that kind of thing. Now, moral comes from the, stand, from the thing that the concern to be generally a good person. Most atheists and agnostics even have this. They, they want to be good moral people in their mind. But of course, what do they get their morals from? We're not sure. And therapeutic means we live in a therapeutic age in which feelings dominate and now determine much in religion, culture, politics, and law. So again, I think we have to add that to our, our list of, of who is Jesus and how people look at Jesus. So keep all those things in mind. But let's get back to uh, our, hopefully you all printed out your, your worksheet. Back to this. Okay, number one, the Bible tells us that Jesus is God the Son. Note, we say Jesus is because Jesus isn't dead, physically or otherwise. Now, I know this is all basic to you guys, but remember, this class was set up for people that maybe are newly Christian or don't have any idea about theology. So we want to point out that it's a, it's a current situation. Jesus is God the Son. Jesus isn't just a man who caused such a stir that all history was recorded around him, A.D., B.C. He wasn't just a good preacher. We have to realize that Jesus is God and God the Son. So, tricky question here. This is a homework question. When was God the Son born? Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're partially right, yeah. And again, we're think think theological here, not not practical. When was God the son born? He's eternal, co-eternal. Okay, so Okay, so he wasn't God the son was not born. Keep that in mind. Jesus we're going to get to this in a minute was born, but God the son was not born. Now, don't let that obviously that can be confusing. Uh, God the Son was present in the beginning. If you read John 1, 1 to 3, the first chapter of John, uh, verse 14 confirms that the word is Jesus. He was present in the beginning and it is God. So he took part in creation. Everything was made through him. And we see an emphatic statement of Jesus' preexistence before anything existed in Micah. Turn to Micah 5.2 if you have your Bibles. might take you out to find Micah. Micah 5, 2. It's 
soon as someone gets that, read it, please. I hear all these pages turning rapidly. Good. What do you say it was? 5 2? 5 2, yeah. And pay attention to the last half of the verse, the first half, too, but the last half is what we're looking for. Read Micah 5 2, somebody. Bethlehem Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah. You will come from, <clears throat> one will come for you to be the ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. Okay, and another version says from the days of eternity. So, again, we see that God the Son was present in the beginning. He's eternal. He's been always there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And again, I said in verse 14 of this, it's, it ties the Word and, and, and Jesus together. So we want to stress that. There's Micah 5, 2. Whose goings forth are, and from of old, from everlasting. Okay, B. God the Son retains His divine nature. <coughs> we can read, you can write these down. Uh, Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, a lot of people get tripped up with this firstborn. Uh, does, that does not mean uh, the oldest child. It means the preeminent one, the first one. Uh, Colossians 2.9. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay, it's pretty hard to argue with that verse. Jesus possesses all the attributes of God. He's, and we've talked about this before. He's omnipresent, which means what? He's everywhere. Everywhere. Omnipotent means what? All knowing. Okay, and, and omniscient? All powerful. Okay, it's, I think that's the opposite. Uh, omnipotent. Wait, is, is all uh, almighty? Almighty and omniscient means all knowing. That's okay. He's all oh. those things. Uh, holy, immutable, if you read Hebrews 13 8. He sustains all things, <laughs> Hebrews 1 3. He's equal to God, Philippians 2 5 and 6. So there we go. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God. <clears throat> okay, so again, number A, Jesus, the. God the Son was present in the beginning in creation. He was involved in creation. B, God the Son retains his divine nature. The Bible is very clear that Jesus is God. Now, again, uh, when people attack Christianity, the two biggest things they attack is the veracity of the Bible and who Jesus was. So keep that in mind. When you're dealing with other people, talking with other people, those are the two biggies that people go after. Um, that's a very good reason to commit our lives to Jesus. You know, would you commit your life to the, this is going to sound horrible, to the mayor of Bucyrus or Galleon? Probably not. No matter how nice these people are, I don't know who the mayor of Galleon is. The mayor of Bucyrus is a nice guy, but I wouldn't commit my life to him. I wouldn't die for him. Uh, but Jesus, the son of God, gives us a reason to commit to him. He isn't just a man who had a bunch of good ideas. He's not like a Buddha or uh, Muhammad, who, who had good ideas, but was not God. He is God. So I, if I follow what Jesus taught, I don't have to wonder if these are human ideas that might not be right. So again, that's another key. Uh, depending upon who you follow, you have to wonder, where did they get their ideas and is it right? Well, if you're following the Son of God, who is God, and he's all-knowing and all-powerful, you don't have to worry if his ideas are right or wrong. I know his teachings are right. There's even more to convince us. So number two, Jesus is human. Now, again, if you follow church history, uh, the first 600 years or more of church history, there was all these, these debates and battles about was Jesus God or was Jesus human? Which was he? And how did they finally end that up? Anybody? Who won that battle? He was both, so. That's, you're right. They came to the conclusion that he was both. This was a radical idea. He wasn't 50% God and 50% human. He was 100% God and 100% human. Now, it was hard to understand. Even today, we have a hard time figuring that out. 
but Jesus is human. So, quick question, how does him being human or his humanity convince you to convince, commit your life to him? Wouldn't that be the opposite? Think about that for a moment. Someone want to answer that? State the question again, Rich. Yeah, how might how does his humanity convince you to commit your life to him? Him being human. It was showing you how uh, somebody who is human should be able to um, accomplish the things through like, of course he was able to do it, do it because he's also, a, he was also divine, but it's, um, it's, it, I guess at the more that you study it, the more it makes sense because you can see that it fulfills prophecies and things of that nature. He had to be human for it to, to, uh, be the new Adam and all those types of things. So I don't know for somebody who's new, that might be very difficult to, okay. to see that that fulfills that. Yeah, we'll be talking about that <clears throat> more and more here in a little later on. But again, think of the human aspect. Uh, who do we worship or who do we admire as humans? I mean, who are our heroes? Think about it that way. You know, would, do you admire the, let, let's take a war example. Do you admire the guy that turned and ran and went back in the foxhole and cowered? Do you got, admire the guy that chased the machine gun down and got shot three times and got the Medal of Honor? Right. I mean, who do we admire? Think about that on Jesus. You know, what did Jesus do as a human that we admire him for? He was tempted in every way that we are okay. and overcame. To overcome. And ultimately, what did he do for us? He was our savior. Our savior, yes. He went to the he cross. Died for us. Yes, physically. Again, remember, he was God, but he was human too. You know, how many how many humans would would go to the cross and die for the whole race? I mean, as a purely a human so just even on the human basis i mean we this is some somebody that we would respect and someone we might want to follow or listen to or commit our lives to so also as you said it gives us the promise of eternity with god now next week our lessons on salvation so that'd be a very interesting lesson uh the the doctrine of salvation how that happens after we receive salvation we have to finish out this life before we experience eternity with god so again that that helps us to think Jesus lived on earth for what, 33 and a half years, roughly. So uh, he had experience living on earth here so we can follow him. And it was pointed out since Jesus experienced life as a man, as a human, we can approach him with all our struggles and know he's been through it. And if you want to turn to Hebrews 4, uh, 14 and 15 here, seeing that we have this great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So again, this is a big thing. Uh, you know, we, we like to follow guides or people know what they're doing. Uh, you know, if you're traveling to a foreign country and you've never been there before, uh, who would you rather have in charge? Someone that a native that lives there and speaks good English and is a guide and understands everything, or uh, someone you grabbed off the plane to come with you? you know, it's a dumb question, but you understand that. Not only does he understand what we're going through, but his life demonstrates how we should handle it. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, he is a great example <clears throat> for how we should react when things happen to us in our lives, how he reacted. Can someone give me an example of how Jesus reacted that maybe we should model when he was here on earth? When Satan tempted him, he returned to scripture. Right. Good, good, good example, Doug. Uh, great demonstration of how we are to handle temptation. He could have done it otherwise. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe he needed to quote the scripture because he was human to be able to avoid the temptation. But just remember, we can learn very much about how to live life by looking at the life of Jesus. And in fact, if you want a really good, good uh, explanation of that, the deacons went through a study a couple years ago called, I think, The Life of Christ, where it was a 50-day study. And we took the Bible chronologically and studied all about Jesus in a more personal manner. 
from when he was little till uh, when he went back to heaven. So very, very good. Okay, Jesus human, his birth. Obviously, if you're gonna be human, you have to be born. So this is our basis for claim that Jesus experienced life on earth as we have. We said that Jesus is God and divine in nature. When Jesus became human, did he stop being God? No. Oh, correct. Now, again, we don't understand that 100%. But just as we have a human nature and because of the fall in the garden, we have had, <clears throat> had added to us a sin nature as well. We do. But God the Son is divine by nature, and he had added to himself, without losing anything, a human nature, and his incarnation as Jesus. Again, this is what threw people off for so many years. They couldn't figure out how a person could be fully God and fully human at the same time. Now, his conception alone declares his divine nature remained when he added a human nature. Again, how does his conception alone preserve his divine nature, but yet add a human nature? Now, we all know this question, the answer. Because Mary was a virgin. Okay. And, and sin, had, sin entered through man, not through woman. Okay. So. so the Holy Spirit was the one that impregnated Mary. How that happened, we have no idea. But his divine nature came in and his human nature came in through, through Mary. Okay. So when Jesus became flesh, he was still God. So let me ask this question. How can we say that Jesus experienced life as we did then? If he was still fully God. Well, I think you need to understand him being fully God, Rich. I think that, in my opinion, is, yes, he was fully God, but he set that right aside to become human. So he was still, I guess if you say it, technically still God, but when he was born, he was fully human. He had set his divinity or his divine nature aside to become human. Okay, and then he picked it, and then he, and then he picked it back up after the cross. Okay, that's, that's just how I've always understood it. Is that that's the easiest way to because otherwise, how would he have ever experienced things like me and you if he were still God? Right. If if he was like you know the Greek mythology, like Hercules, you know Hercules was half God, half man, and he experienced things here on Earth as a half God, half man. He uses half God powers. Uh, Jesus did not do that. Uh, Jesus, as Doug is correct, that isn't just your opinion. That's what the Bible says. We could give you some verses on that, which we might do here later on. Uh, the key is Philippians 2, 5 through 8. <clears throat> Jesus emptied himself in the process of becoming human. Write that down, Philippians 2, 5, 8. In fact, let's turn there. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. And we're going we're gonna to state what Doug just stated, only this is what the Bible says, so his opinion is correct. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Have this, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm reading from the NASB today. Have this attitude in yourselves, which also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not requ regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself to become obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Okay. So we see, we see that. Uh, he didn't lose his divine nature. How, however, he denied himself certain divine powers that weren't comparable with the human experience of, or God's will. So, he denied his omnipresence while he was here on earth, which means what? He was only one place at one time. Okay, good. He could not be in Jerusalem and Galilee at the same time before his crucifixion. <clears throat> okay, so he denied that. He laid that aside. Uh, this is hard to understand. He de denied his, his uh, omniscience. How do we know that? Anyone know that? Jesus did not know everything that could be known. He was human. Uh, as he was growing up, he had to learn like a human. He learned how to speak, how to talk, how to read. Uh, you know, if he was born fully God, he, those things would have been instant. 
Uh, there's times when he said, I don't know, only the Father knows. So again, he set aside his all-knowing uh, for a moment there until crucifixion. He was here when he got hungry. He was tempted. He felt pain and emotion just like we do. How do we know he felt pain and emotion? Give me some examples. When last, when last, yeah, I was just about to say that. <laughs> what Lazarus did you say? Died. When Lazarus, Lazarus died, died, yes, he was overcome with emotion and did what? Wept. Wept. Yeah, I think we we could say cried. I don't like the word wept. I mean, let's let's say cried. I know men don't cry, but uh, Jesus was crying. Uh, they translated it wept. A little older word there. And remember this, this is important. Jesus did not live as a human when everything was going okay, but when things started to go bad, he pulled his God powers out. Okay? He lived as a human continuously. Remember that. So I have a question on that then, Rich. Yes, I was hoping you would ask I'm not, that. I'm just being Doug, okay? Go ahead. So if that's the case, what's the point of walking on water? Okay, we'll get into that when we, <laughs> when we discuss... Uh, the theology of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but the short answer, the short answer is uh, a couple times during his life, he did pull back his veil and maybe add some of his God powers to demonstrate something. So that's the short answer. Uh, obviously, Peter was able to do it for a while, too, uh, until he lost his focus and, and started to sink. So that's the short answer. You have to wait a couple <laughs> weeks for the long answer. But good question. We like questions. Right. Yes. I have another question. Okay. So if he kind of set it aside, then how, like with the, because I feel like in my mind, setting it aside would make him, I don't know, susceptible to temptation and like would give him the sin nature unless I'm, I, I don't know how that works. That I don't know. That's kind of well, throwing me for a loop. Well, think of it this way, Emily. Uh, he did set his God powers aside, but the key was he did not have a sin nature. Okay. Uh, because he did not inherit that through Adam. But remember, Adam didn't have a sin nature either, and he still sinned. So it was possible for Jesus to sin. But as Doug said, he knew enough to be able to quote scripture to resist sin. But he was like okay. us. He was able to resist sin. So we do know that it is, it is possible to resist sin. Uh, but it, it's very hard. So again, when we talk about salvation next week, and then a little more doctrines of other weeks, we'll go into that a little more deeper. But good okay. question. Now, <clears throat> so, Jesus, so, what, we, so what does sin nature, I mean, not having sin nature, what does that then, what, I guess, what's that, what, what difference is that? How, how could he be all of me and yet not have sin nature? I mean, I, I know he didn't. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Well, again, well, don't, I don't understand that either, Doug. All I know is, you know, we have a sin nature that causes us to turn temptations into sins, plural. Remember last week we talked about the difference between sin and sins. Uh, so he was able to be tempted. Couldn't, this, couldn't it be that this world is controlled by Satan at this point? It is. And yes. so that's why he could be tempted because Satan was in control of this world at that right. time. And he was tempted and he did resist all temptation. Again, I, the only thing I can think of is I go back to Adam and Eve. Again, they had no sin nature when they were created. They were created without a sin nature. The sin nature came uh, after they fell to temptation. So I, again, these are things, now you can see why people struggled for 600 years. I mean, these aren't things you you solve in an hour so but good keep these things in mind a little bit will come out more next week when we talk about salvation so his life uh matthew 20 25 to 28 what how did he live what does it say up here in the screen as a servant as a servant jesus, the life of jesus modeled servanthood and discipleship jesus gave us the game game plan for our lives if we want to be first in god's kingdom we live with a what type of attitude Servant. Servant attitude. Uh, that doesn't mean you lie down and let the world run over you. 
Jesus certainly didn't do that when the money changes were at the temple. We know that. But his example of kindness, compassion, and humility should be our model. And, you know, you have to understand this. This probably won't make you first in the world system. You probably will not be able to climb the ladder as far as some of the people, as far as other people in this world, because with, with your set of Jesus uh, attitudes and lifestyle, you probably won't make it as far up the ladder as possible. But here's the point. Which system seems more important in the long run? The world system, which is temporary for anywhere from zero to maybe 100 years, or, or God's system, which is eternal? You got to th always be thinking that. You know, that's, that's a easy question. It's hard, though, when you're in the midst of the current situation to be thinking eternal. Now, again, you don't want to be thinking so much eternal that it, you, it messes up your temporary here, too. But just remember, because of the example and the full assurance in Hebrews 4 that he knows and understands exactly what our struggles are like, we can give him a full allegiance. Again, our lesson today is why follow this guy? Why give a full allegiance to this guy? Because Jesus is fully God, fully human. Okay, so his birth, his life, and then, of course, his death. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried, rose again the third day physically. And again, how many other people in the human history did that? Come on, answer that, somebody. Rose from the dead? How many people physically died on the cross, a cross or, or anything, was buried and rose again three days later physically, came back to life, and then... Uh, Christ. Again, so again, our whole point in this lesson is why should we give religions to him? He's unique, he's different. This sets him aside from every other single person that was human, ever and ever to be. So, I mean, you got to understand that, and you all do that. So, because of that, we can have a relationship with Jesus. We know that. This may be the most compelling reason for committing our life to Jesus. To us, Jesus is more than the invisible image, or an image of the invisible God. He's more than pages of big teachings. He's more than a great example. For those of us who have accepted his salvation, he is a genuine day-to-day -day relationship. That's, that's another big reason. So what is the first requirement for us to have a relationship with someone else? Don't to think too them. much. It isn't rock and to know them. To, to know, know them and spend time with them. Very simple. If you want to have a relationship with somebody, you have to spend time with them. That's why uh, so many people try a long-distance relationships. Do long-distance relationships work very long, normally? No. Why not? Lack of contact. Yeah, lack of intimacy, lack of contact, lack of spending time. Now, some, some long-distance relationships do last, but not for a real long time. I mean, you have to make a change sooner or later and, and, and uh, spend some time together. Okay, good. So, again, Jesus is alive. Uh, that makes it important. It's hard to have a relationship with someone that's dead. Uh, Mark... <laughs> Mark uh, 6, 5, and 6, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. So again, uh, those who worship Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius or anyone else, uh, Jim Jones, whatever, they can't have a relationship with them because why? Yeah. They're not alive. They're dead. Okay, good. But believers can walk with Jesus. They can talk to him. How do we talk to Jesus? It says here. Boldly prayer. come to the throne. Prayer, come boldly to the throne of grace. That's how we talk with Jesus. Okay, we can, Jesus, we talk to him. Jesus helps us. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus is always with us. Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you, how often? Always. Always. 100%, always, even to the end of the age. So when things get tough and the end of the age is coming and things are all over the place, is Jesus going to be with us? Yes. yes. Keep that in mind. Okay, good. And Jesus loves us. 
Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So again, something to hang your hat on here. Uh, so in conclusion... Are we convinced to commit our lives to Jesus? We've given a lot of reasons to do that today. He is God. He's more than a man or a prophet. He's more than the rock music Jesus or the country music Jesus. He's God. He experienced life as a man. He provided the perfect example for us. We can have a real relationship with him. So here's our big idea. We saved it for last. Jesus deserves my full devotion. Hebrews 4, 15, and 16. Okay. Uh, homework. Whoop, back up here. Homework is on your worksheet. Pick three of the following passages and consider all that Jesus' death and the cross accomplished. Okay, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's eight or nine different verses here. So that's your homework for next week. Pick three of those and consider all that Jesus' death and the cross accomplished. Next week's topic is salvation. Very interesting topic, obviously. Any questions or comments? Hey, so Rich, have, can, you, yes. can you see that Melinda or I get emailed? We haven't been getting the worksheets. You know, you have to go online on the website and go to, okay. go to current Sunday School Studies, and there's a little... There's a little uh, envelope there. You click on okay. that, and it has all the worksheets there. Okay. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Didn't know that. Oh, and uh, and the each week I add it, so all the past ones are there right now too. So, any questions from the from Emma and uh, that area? You guys okay? Okay. <laughs> whose whose hand is that? You guys are muted. So I'll find out when I get to church. Over here. Yeah, I know. I'm thinking, yeah, someone's, okay, good. No questions or comments. We'll close in prayer, and then we'll all see you at church. Uh, Father, thank you for this, this lesson. It was very basic. We knew most of these things, but it's good to be reminded once in a while. It's good to look in your word and see where these things are found. It's good to understand why do we follow you? Why do we love you? Why are you worthy of our, 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 our total devotion, our sacrifice? It's because you are the Son of God and the things you've done. And we can give our full allegiance to you with, because you're all-knowing and all-powerful. So we ask you to go with us to the service here in the next 45 minutes and be with us today and throughout the week. Bless every family represented here, every person. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. See you all next week. See ya. Bye. <laughs>